You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. Well, hi, everybody. This is Glenn Geek, founder of the Horse Radio Network and host of Horses in the Morning, the daily podcast. It's one of the longest running ones in the world. We've been doing it for 14 years. Welcome to the WESA Retail Roundup, or WESA, depending on how you want to say it. I say it both ways. The Retail Roundup is your go-to virtual hub for all things retail. Join panel discussions, learn from webinars, share your thoughts, ask questions, and connect with the community. We host a virtual event or share educational content every Monday. And you can find most of that at Retail Roundup's Facebook group. If you're not a member of that, go search for Retail Roundup on Facebook and join there. And today we're going to gain practical advice from an industry expert dedicated to making success straightforward and achievable for barrel racers and retailers. We're excited to welcome Brianna Brown, a barrel racing trainer and content creator with a deep understanding of horsemanship and a flair for social media marketing. With extensive competing and training experience, Brianna excels in creating content and enhances brand awareness, engagement, and sales for retailers, which is what we're all looking for. Her practical insights into marketing tack items make her a valuable resource for retailers looking to enhance their brand, customer experience, and sales, of course. Hi, Brianna. Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. It's so much fun. Now, what part of the world are you in? So I am in Idaho currently. Okay, cool. So you're going to chat with us today and you have a presentation that we're going to be able to share with everybody. I did want to mention that you're going to be having slides. So if you're listening to this on the podcast and want to catch it on the video forum, then just head over to uh, the Retail Roundtable Facebook group and you'll find it there. So that'd be probably your best bet for finding the video version. Are you ready to start? I'm ready to roll. All right. Okay, well, super excited to be on here. I've been nerding out about this for the last few weeks or so. So I just want to get on super quick and kind of share with you guys a little bit of my knowledge and things that I've kind of noticed in the tech industry with, you know, trends, in-store selling, selling on a website. I mean, so many different things I just kind of wanted to hit on. Um, if you ask my husband, I walk through the tax store all the time with him and I'm like, they should do that different and they should do that. I can't shut my marketing brain off. It's just, it's not going to work. So, um, let me quickly introduce myself though. My name is Brianna Brown. Like you mentioned, um, I'm from Idaho. I'm a barrel racer and most people know me off of social media. So if you have seen me on Instagram or TikTok, I'm also on Facebook or Pinterest. It's all under barrel racing training help. So I am really focused on bringing horsemanship back into barrel racing. So I do a lot online with show social media and creating content for companies. And then for myself, really just to teach people how to train horses, how to care for them, how to feed them correctly um, and all that, you know, everything in between. So I do a lot of clinics across the U.S. and I do in-person lessons. I do coaching calls, like anything you can think of horses, I do it. So um, I've kind of fallen in love with just teaching people ultimately, whether it's in person or in social media, really just how to, again, train and care for your horses. So um, like super fast background, like when I started, I had no coach, no trainer. I literally just learned off of like YouTube University. And there was like not a whole lot out there to really teach me like what to do and how to, you know, train a horse, how to care for him. And so when I got going down the road and kind of got it more figured out, I was like, man, I should be teaching people this because I have so much experience and I've, you know, done a lot of research. I've, you know, obviously since now really just teamed up with a lot of different trainers to really learn the best ways to have that horsemanship, but still barrel race. And then also how to really just take care of those horses at the highest level. Cause if any of you guys are kind of, you know, in the barrel racing or the horse world or competition, like you really have to be top of your game and you got to be able to actually care for your horse as well. So that is kind of my focus. And that's kind of where I'm at a little bit about me, but let's kind of get into this a little bit and I can kind of walk you through um, some highlights and some things that I see in the tack industry. So a couple of my favorites, if you guys are on the podcast, maybe I'll not be able to see this, but There is so, so, so many awesome things going on in the tack world right now. And I want to say my favorites are going to be like the custom stuff. So the custom stuff has been around for quite a while, but I feel like 
a lot of these tech industries are really like branching out to create some really, really awesome stuff. Um, so I'm really liking the fact that like you can come in and you can design a bit that's specific for your horse and specific for what you need, or you can design a saddle pad like I have shown in these pictures, um, really just to make sure you're getting the right thickness, the right length, and then also making sure that it's just gorgeous and how you like it. So those are a couple of my favorites that I've absolutely loved. And for all of you guys that are buying tack and getting ready to resell them, or maybe you're creating the tack, I think the custom space is such a cool one to be a part of. Um, really cause not that many people are doing it. So I feel like it's such a good one to kind of get in on. I feel like with the horse world, um, if you can get in on a trend really quickly, it's the best thing to do. Um, so those are some of my, I guess, favorites, cool stuff that I really, really love. So kind of to go over like tack resale, um, you know, this may fit some of you, this may not fit some of you, but, um, some of the coolest things I think that are missed when reselling tack is really just having like a huge selection of sizes, colors, brands. You know, a lot of times I go to a tack store and I see like one brand and not very many sizes, not very many colors. Um, for instance, like over 16 hands, there is not a lot of tack out there. They're at least in stores to fit these horses. And so um, when you are looking for something to resell, I would dare say it's going to be your best bet to have something that's going to fit lots of different sizes of horses. So if you can fit something in the 14 hand range and then obviously 15 and then even 16 and higher, you're going to end up, you know, reaching a bigger audience than just having the normal average sized horse, if that makes sense. So um, that's such a huge niche, again, that's kind of missed. Um, and then also just making sure things are unique, but not too out there. So that's some of the biggest things I've realized when, you know, I go to a tax store and I'm looking at things and like seeing the marketing side that I know, um, and, you know, kind of back from the social media side that I've also seen, there's not necessarily a whole lot of like unique stuff out there. So I think if you can hit something that's really unique really beautiful, but not too wild and out there, then that's going to be like such a sweet spot. Um, also having something that's functional. So I see a lot of tag pieces out there that is so hard to use. Like for instance, like you look at a head stall and you have to like sit there and weave everything like five different ways to even put a bit on there. It's frustrating. So if you can find, and I'll share in a couple of slides, but if you can find a way to have really functional tack, that's going to be the coolest, best way that you can, you know, kind of go about selling tack and also just becoming somebody that everyone wants to buy from just because you have like the latest, the greatest type stuff. Um, some of the other stuff is obviously like the price ranges. I see a lot of like only in this price range. So I would try and branch out and still keep the high quality, but try and get like lower quality or sorry, higher quality, but lower price tack and then higher quality, higher price tack. That way you have more of like a range. Um, and that way you're reaching more people. You know, you have a lot of beginners that they're starting out. They don't necessarily have the money or want to spend a million dollars on tack. And so if you can kind of reach those, um, people as well, that's also so, so, so good and important as well. So, um, also carrying like trusted brands. So, a lot of times when you have someone going into the store or someone going online to look at the tax selections you may have, a lot of times they're going to be looking at something that a trainer has recommended to them or for nowadays, social media, like social media is huge. So if they're on social media, seeing somebody that has this XYZ tax brand, they're going to go in store on, you know, line and look for that tack brand. So if you can really carry those tack brands and, you know, have the name stuff, the stuff that's kind of trending, then ultimately you're going to create the sales and, you know, create that trust with um, the people coming in to buy. So kind of to talk about some more of like innovation stuff that I've seen in the tack world, which I think is so important. I mean, constantly every industry is evolving and we have to also make sure we're evolving in the horse world as well. Um, sometimes I think people forget that that's really important still. So you could kind of see here 
on the screen, um, this top left-hand corner, hopefully that's not flipped, but top left-hand corner for mine, is going to be a halter that um, Weaver actually just came out with. Um, there may be some other brands that like do something similar to this, but this halter has been like the coolest innovation probably that I have seen by far. And so it's a rope halter and then it's got more of a ring down under their chin. And so what that allows is I really like it because it gets a lot more feel out of a horse. So if I'm sending a horse in the trailer or I'm teaching them to tie or I even get on bareback and I want to just ride around, I really love that when I go to draw on one side of the rope, I'm going to actually get almost like a feel like a bit instead of having to like grab the whole halter and move it over. So I really think it's such a cool training tool that they've kind of, you know, came up with that's so, so, so awesome. So that would be one that I would for sure recommend, like keeping in mind that could be a cool innovation product to kind of keep um, in your stores as well. And then also kind of talking about um, just like some general stuff. A lot of people or a lot of, I guess I should say, like tech brands have came out with um, products that are like moisture wicking. So whether that's sports boots or bell boots or a saddle pad or a cinch, it's really cool that they have created a product where the material just wicks the moisture off and really just keeps it you know, cool and the moisture and the sweat and the heat is not just sitting right on that horse. So if you think you go on a cattle drive for hours and hours and hours and you've got a cinch on that's super, super hot, that's uncomfortable for a horse. You're going to get heat sores and all the stuff and things. And so it's really cool that they've came up with um, materials in these products that have just really wicked the moisture away and helped. So um, you can kind of keep those horses cool, which I think is amazing. So, and then another one that I've seen, and this has probably been around for quite a while, but I like that they've been adding more to this. Um, I've seen more and more tech brands kind of adding on to this, but you can kind of see in the top or the bottom right hand corner, this is a head stall that's got um, clips on the side. So it's really easy to change a bit out instead of like having to sit there and wrap around like your little piece of leather and tie the bit on. Like, so for trainers or people who are riding horses a bunch, um, or even just a beginner that doesn't un like doesn't necessarily know how to put those on. That is so cool that they have those clips that you can just change that bit out super, super easy. And it's not even hard. So I really love that as well. So a couple of like, don't forget um, that I guess I see quite a bit in tax stores is people forgetting to have the rope halters. So I see a lot of like nylon halters, um, but you got to keep in mind, you're not only going to have people come into your store that love one certain thing. I like, I really think it's important to have more of like a general um, selection. So the rope halters, having a saddle pad with wider widths. So keep in mind, people are breeding barrel horses and they're breeding quarter horses to be bigger and bigger and bigger. They look more and more like a tank and these wider saddle pads are going to be so important that you can actually get something wide enough that when you throw the saddle on, you're going to have it come down longer than the actual saddle itself. So that's something I see people missing quite a bit in their tax stores that I think is got to have it so good. Um, and then obviously like more of a bit selection. So I feel like in most tax stores that I see, unless it's like specific two bits, they have like the normal snaffle, the O-ring, the Tom Thumb, which we're going to talk about that in a minute. But I feel like I just see the same type bits around. So definitely be cool to kind of add more ported bits in there and really just have um, more of a selection for people to choose from. So also having billets, that's also one that I feel like people miss all the time. And then also a longer latigo that's important. I don't know why we still have short latigos. You got to have some longer ones. A lot of these horses, again, are being bred to be bigger and bigger and bigger um, and more stronger, more muscly. You got to have a little bit longer of latigos. They're not super small anymore. So um, also a really interesting one that I kind of thought of and I was like, oh, I don't actually see that very often in stores anymore um, are the buddy stirrups. So that is something that like if you have a younger rider or a shorter rider and they're in a saddle um, that their stirrups don't actually like fit with their body, you can get like these buddy stirrups and kind of just adjust them and have them sit on the saddle. Um, that's quite like an audience that I think people miss because you have younger kids that are wanting to ride, but 
their parents don't want to buy them a saddle every single year because they're going to grow out of it. So um, that's also one I thought that was pretty important to have as well. And then also just having those leather ties. So um, the thin leather ties that you can kind of use to like tie your latigo on or um, really whatever else you might need. I feel like those also are important. Otherwise, you know, it's pretty hard to like have a whole complete tack program or tack set without those. So kind of to go over some of the in-store tips that I have um, for your sales reps as they're going around the store or really wherever you might be selling. Um, and they, they may seem a little basic, but trust me, I've gone to a lot of tax stores and sometimes I like to have fun and I play dumb and I pretend like I know nothing. And I just like to have people tell me what they can tell me. And I just sit there like, oh, it's probably not the right answer. So really make sure that your sales reps know the products, how to size them, the benefits, and then really just any other general information that, you know, someone might be looking for as they come in. Again, seems basic, but I can tell you there's not a lot of people out there that actually like, you know, know how to do that. So also keep in mind, like your sales reps could be a beginner's first con like point of contact, right? So I feel like in the horse world, it's such a small community. I mean, you know, it's big, but small in the sense of like other niches that it's really important to like try and help each other out where we can, um, especially the beginners, because they've got to be able to take care of their horse correctly and ride them correctly. And so if your sales reps can be that, you know, beginners first point of contact that they can kind of set them in the right direction. That's always so important. I think really, really, really so helpful, so beneficial. So um, also, you know, just any other ideas beyond just like an obvious answer. If someone comes in, they want to know something, you know, try and help your sales reps to have some other ideas of, you know, just beyond the obvious answer. Okay, so now this is probably like my favorite one to talk about. Um, I completely forgot to mention in the very beginning, but I actually have my bachelor's degree in social media marketing. So like I said, I can't turn my marketing brain off. I just, I nerd out about it all the time. So um, a couple of in-store tips, I guess, when you're selling tack. Um, and I really love this. I had to take a picture of this. Um, I think this was at Cow Ranch, but Stanley Forge has like, you can kind of see on the pictures. For those of you guys that are on the podcast, I'll do my best to explain. <laughs> I might be not good at this, but I basically what they do is they have like a huge booklet on the end of their shelf and it opens up and it can turn a couple of pages and it has a bunch, a bunch of information in it. So um, for specifically to like forage, they had, you know, what type of forage may your horse need? Um, you know, how much should they get? All of that kind of stuff. And then more about their products. So when I saw this, I was like, oh my gosh, this would be so cool for tech brands to kind of introduce into their stores is having these booklets and having things like, okay, here's what you need as a beginner. Here's all the tack you might need. Um, a guide to sizing. I get asked that all the time. Like, how do I size X, Y, Z piece of tack for my horse? Um, and then also something that's cool that really not very many tack brands take advantage of is just explaining, here's this piece of tack. Here's the situation it might be needed for. Um, and then also, like, we'll talk about this in a second, but when you're marketing in-store, really make sure that you're like racks and your like displays are put together in a way that really just like entices people to want to buy. So um, again, like don't let the organization and the aesthetics be an afterthought. Um, kind of like paint a picture because I feel like in marketing, we have to be able to step into, you know, the buyer's shoes. And so stepping into the buyer's shoes, you know, when I go into a tax store and I'm looking around and if I just like walk in and there's tack everywhere, it's a mess, nothing is organized, nothing looks that good. Like 10 times out of 10, I'm not buying anything. Like it's just too overwhelming. I, I don't know. I just, I don't like it. So I don't, I don't usually buy from that kind of stuff. Now, if I go into a tax store, sometimes with the intent not to buy, <laughs> we all know who that is. Um, and I see something laid out just beautifully, like sections, it looks really nice. They have a bunch of different options, but it's still put together in a way that's easy to find, but looks really good. I'm usually going to come out with a piece of tack I didn't intend on going in there to buy. So keep that in mind. Like sales is always the goal. We want to, you know, gain that trust and then create the sales. 
Um, so this is one of the biggest ways I think people miss is just really find a way to make it look aesthetically pleasing. Um, that's such a big thing. Like if you go into like a Walmart or Costco or, you know, whatever it might be, and they have some sort of display, it always looks really, really nice. And people spend a lot of marketing dollars just to make it look nice. And it really does pay off. So same thing for tech. So now kind of talking a little bit online marketing tech, I don't know how many people, you know, maybe do this or whatnot, but I figured I'd just add it in there again. Can't turn the marketing brain off. It's just going. So kind of talking about online stuff now, um, I think the biggest thing that I see tech brands kind of missing is really just when you list a tech piece on your website, having more information. And I totally understand that maybe the information is not there. So, you know, reach out to people like me or somebody, some trainer you trust that can really just help you and um, explain to your team like, hey, this is what this is for. This is when it might be needing to be used, all of that kind of stuff. So if you can put a piece of tech, for example, like a bit, you put a bit on your website, you know, have nice pictures of it, put it on a horse. That's a big one. Put the tack piece on a horse so we don't just see a tack piece on a white background. That's kind of boring. Um, you got to, you know, put it on a horse, make it look beautiful. Again, these people are buying to put on their horse. So think about that. Put it, put it on a horse, take a picture. Um, but putting in the description, like, okay, this is what this product does. This is what it might be used for. Um, and then maybe this is the type of writer that, you know, this could be used for. So, um, I think kind of, again, stepping back into the sell or the buyer shoes, you know, if they go to a website and they see a bit and they're like, man, that's cool looking, but I don't necessarily know if that's even going to help my horse or if that's even what I want. You know, a lot of people don't, they don't actually have the access to the trainer. So if you guys can explain on the website, this is what this does. This is how cool it is. This is what kind of rider it needs. This is what it can do. Immediately that trust level is gained and you're going to nine times out of 10 get that sale. So um, that's something, again, I don't see a whole lot of tack brands doing. There's a little bit, there's a little, you know, there's a little bit here and there, I feel like. Um, but if you could really hone in on that, I guarantee you, your sales are going to skyrocket. So, um, also I think something that would be really cool to put, especially just with products online is put a video out. Like you guys have marketing teams or you can outsource to content creators with putting a video out on like, here's how this product works. Here, here's how to put it on. Um, especially if you get something in that has new technology, you know, the horse world's coming out with new technology all the time. If you can put a video out again to create that trust and then get the sales, really just explaining what this new technology is, how to do it. Um, and again, having those high quality images, high quality videos, then again, the sales really just skyrockets. So something to kind of, I guess, keep in mind, and this is one that I, you know, I want to put in because I feel like I see this all the time in tax stores and it kind of drives me up the wall. Um, but really just to earn the trust and secure the sale, it's really essential for people to know that you have a comprehensive understanding of your products. So if you think about it, if you go to a trainer, maybe it's not horses, maybe it's swimming or running or biking or whatever it might be. If you go to a trainer, and they fully understand like what they're talking about. You ask them a question. They know what they're talking about. They can recommend something to you. You trust them, right? And you're going to immediately buy whatever under the sun they mention that you should get in order to be successful. You're going to do it. Now, if you go to a trainer that or a trainer, I should say quotation marks, that you ask questions to and they're like, I have, I don't know. I don't know the answer or they're not helpful or whatnot, you immediately don't trust them, right? And if they make a recommendation to you, it's like, eh, no, thank you. You don't really know what you're talking about. So same with selling anything. You've got to be able to understand what you're selling and what you're doing. So just as like a small example for this um, is the Tom Thumb bits. These bits are sold in stores everywhere. It's always a bit that people sell. And for some reason, beginners always, I guess, gravitate to this bit. And this is like one of the worst bits you can ever, you know, put on your horse, like across the board. If you ask anyone that knows what they're talking about, this is always going to be a bit that nobody will recommend. Um, the reason why is you can kind of see in the right hand picture and I won't go too much into this, but 
in the right hand picture, the bit in whatever way you draw on the reins or whatnot, it's always going to give a different cue for one. It's never going to be across the board, which is insanely confusing for a horse. Um, but also as you pull on the reins, the bit acts as like a nutcracker and it, you know, pries into the sides of the horse's cheek instead of actually working with their mouth um, and, you know, avoiding touching the cheeks. So again, we won't go too much into that, but keep in mind that if you're selling products like this, that clearly most people know are not a good product, your trust level starts to decrease. So try and keep in mind that whatever you put on a shelf, um, try and do some research behind it or talk to somebody. Um, and maybe this is something not anyone even does that I'm talking to, but keep this in mind, like really be aware of what you're selling um, just to make sure that you're creating that trust level and it's not going to like decrease. Okay, so a couple of like, I guess, frequently asked questions that I get on my platforms. Um, again, what I do with social media, I am running across people left and right asking me questions about horses and training and care and all the stuff and things. So um, the most common questions that I get asked um, are simply, what bit should I use? What tack do I need to use for my first horse? How do I size my horse for XYZ tack product? Um, and then also like, what are my favorites? And then what are the best tack brands? So these are things that you can kind of keep into mind um, as you're marketing or you're creating um, a piece of content to really promote your tack products and whatnot. Um, but those are just some things to kind of keep in mind. And then I believe that kind of wraps it up. Um, for those of you watching in video, I'm going to put my contact on the end slide just in case anyone has questions about this. Again, all things nerd marketing over here. I nerd, about, I just will nerd out about it forever. So I'll keep that there just in case you guys want to reach out to me or follow me on socials. Um, but that is all I have. And then if you guys have any questions, you can drop them below um, or you know, we'll see what else came up. And I, I'm here to answer some questions in case we need time. All right. Thank you for that. That was a lot of fun. Now, let me ask you. So you do a lot of social media, obviously. You do a lot of videos and things. And a lot, and some of them are about products. Yes. So what videos get you the most interaction? Where, what kind of videos get you the most interaction? Um, I don't really have one specific way or one specific type. It's really in the way that you explain it. So if I can bring education um, and quick, like, you know, quick just videos to kind of explain something very easily, that's what does the best. Um, just, yeah, there's not necessarily like a type of video just because people follow me for anywhere, again, from like training to care to feeding. So, you know, it doesn't matter too much. They follow me for all of that. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say like there's one specific type that'll work. It's really in how you present the information. Like, I mean, people's, um, I guess their attention spans are so tiny nowadays that if you can just get information across really quickly and in an easy way, um, that really creates views and then trust and engagement and all the stuff and things that kind of what, goes down from there. Do you kind of have a magic number as far as length of videos are concerned? No, there's actually not a magic number. I, I get asked that quite frequently, but no, there's there's not a magic number because, I mean, you may have a video that you can keep people's attention for three minutes, but there may be something where you just can't keep their attention very long and you're going to get seven seconds. So it really is just find a way to keep their attention. Like that's that's the biggest thing. Are there any of the product videos that went viral and kind of surprised you? And could you yeah. figure out why? Yeah, it, yes, there totally was. Um, I did a video for a horse boot company. So like my horses run barefoot. And so there was, they have a boot. I won't say names. I don't know if I'm supposed to do that, but they have a boot that like you can put right on your horse's hoof and it basically acts as like a shoe. And it's like to 600,000 views, I think right now. And that I did not expect. Like I just did the video and I was like, it's kind of salesy. I was like, I don't, I don't usually do salesy videos. I don't really like those. Maybe you so should like, do it more. <laughs> well, and I was like, oh, it's kind of salesy, but like, I don't know. So I like to put it out and I, it just, it blew up. So, I mean, it started conversations about, you know, things that were kind of, I guess, controversial. Like people find out I run my horse barefoot and they're like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. So it started. Do you think that's why it blew up? I would think so. Yeah. Because it started a conversation. Like you can, you know, kind of, pick at something like controversial and, you know, then the conversation starts and people, you know, people want to always add their input like, Oh, I don't believe this. Or, Oh, oh I do believe this. And it just kind of starts it that way. 
As a side note, I don't know when being barefoot became such a controversial thing, right? I mean, isn't that how horses started? <laughs> exactly. Like, that's what I tell people. And I'm like, guys, come on, common sense here. But you know what? Sometimes I, the horse world forgets about common sense. We all know that. But yeah, for sure. So um, as far as your, so as far as your videos are concerned, do you plan exactly what you're going to say? I know it, we, we all, or do you have an outline of what you're going to say? I know you don't have a script, but do you yeah. kind of have an outline and do it that way? And do you edit them or do you not edit them? So it depends. Um, sometimes I'll kind of do them scripted. So, and nothing like too crazy. You all just have like an outline of like, okay, this is how I'm going to start my video. This is point one, two, three. Here's how I'm going to end it. Um, but yeah, like I kind of script them a little bit that way. But for the most part, um, at least when I'm doing organic stuff, I kind of just go off the seat of my pants and just spout whatever I need to spat out. Um, and I've done it long enough that if I say something and get going, and I'm like, that made no sense. Let me just come back, try that again. <laughs> so I kind of do it that way. Um, for a lot of my brand videos or like videos that I'm like, this has got to be like spot on, then I'll usually kind of script it up. Um, and that does usually help quite a bit. But definitely, it just depends. Like it depends on kind of what the video is. And a lot of times TikTok, I'll do longer videos. And I kind of just talk for 10, 10, five minutes and just kind of spout a bunch of information, experiences and so forth out. Um, but for the videos that I'm like, this is quick and short and I just want to, you know, kind of explain things generally, then I'll usually kind of script them out. So one of the questions we get, I get asked by brands all the time is how often should I do something? So if you were to answer that question for a tech shop or a manufacturer, what would you say? Like do something on social media? Social. Or? Yeah. Like videos or whatever. Um, I think it depends. I think some people have this like world that they think I have to post on social media. And if I don't, I won't be successful. And I don't think that's real or true at all. Um, because you may have a tax store that you may have a social account, but you may be selling literally just in person. So I would say, don't even waste your time. So my husband, and I actually own two businesses and mine is very social media related and his is not. And so you really have to figure out, okay, where is my audience? How are they buying from us? And let's hone in on that. So social is great, 110%, but you have to figure out where is my audience and is this going to really work for what I'm doing? So a lot of times, like, you know, if you have a mom and pop tax store, I would say social media may not be like your number one priority just because if you're not selling online and they have to come in location, social media really doesn't help a whole lot because you've got a small audience that you're talking to, whether they live around there or they stop by, they're in the location. So I would really say like, you got to figure out where's your audience, where are they actually buying from? And then kind of go from there. Now say that like you are selling online altogether, that's what you're doing. And then I would dare say like, yeah, social media could be a huge benefit for you. And it's almost like you need to post every single day. Like you've got to be posting, showing people what you're doing, but also keep in mind, like you got to add value. Like people are going to know if you're just posting a picture of like a saddle pad and you're like, buy this saddle pad. No one cares. Like buy something or create something that's going to be either educational or entertaining or just something that can keep people's attention and you can kind of provide value back to. Um, and that really creates like so much trust and then people really want to buy from you. So that's something that I do, like with um, a lot of the brands that I work with, even just beyond tech, like they're selling online. And so that's when I get hired to create content because it's easy to send people back to a website and say, hey, this is kind of what we're doing, or here's a sale going on, or here's just general information about this product and kind of send them back to a website. And those are things that you can be selling all the time for. Like, it's not necessarily like a, oh, if I post once a week, I'll be good. Like, Social media, it's it's all about the relevancy. So you've got to be like top of mind all the time, if that answers your question. But. Yeah. And, you know, I get when I get asked that about podcasts, I say not one minute longer than it, it stops being interesting. It, yeah. So, exactly. you know, there's no set answer. You're absolutely right. If, if two yeah. minutes is all that's interesting, then do two minutes. If, yeah. if it's interesting for 10 minutes or fun or entertaining or engaging in some way, yeah. uh, that's how long you want to do it for. Definitely. A minute okay. longer than that's too long. Yeah. I love that. That's a perfect yeah. answer. And that, and that may require editing. Yes. You know, editing is so important. Yes. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. it, you know, you want to edit the uninteresting out. Right. 
Absolutely. <laughs> That's the goal. Was there anything else you wanted to add as far as the tech businesses? And I guess you're going to be at, uh, you're going to be there in August, right? At WESA? I am for yeah. my first time. I'm so yes. excited. So yes. I'll be there. So people will be able to meet you. Yes. Um, so where can people find you? What's, uh, is that the best place down I have down there is, uh, well, you're basically everywhere at that, uh, at barrel racing training help, right? Yes. Yep. You can find me on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Pinterest, I'm not on Twitter. I do have a Twitter account, but I never got on Twitter. Yeah. No, no, um, no. I'm think, with oh, you. and on YouTube. Yes. And on YouTube. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. I had a lot of fun. Really, appreciate it. Really, really appreciate it. Of course, uh, if uh, you missed any part of this, you can find it. Uh, just head over to uh, the WESA Trade Show on the YouTube channel. You can head to the WESA website at wesatradeshow.com. You can also, of course, head over to the Retail Roundup Facebook page. You can find it there. And we're, we'll be putting the audio version of this out on the podcast Wisdom by WESA. The next Retail Roundup will be posted on Monday. Uh, I think it's next Monday, uh, but I won't be here. So I'm not quite sure what it is. So uh, I'll have to ask Sophia that, but you, you'll, you'll be able to track what it is on the retail roundup. And I'll, I'll be back in a couple of weeks. If you want to find me, I can be found at Horses in the Morning on any podcast player. Where I think we did episode almost 3,500 today. So uh, check it out. We have a lot of fun over there. It's a good time. It's morning drive radio for the horse world. Uh, nothing too serious, but a lot of good fun. So check it out at Horses in the Morning. Thank you for joining us today. And we'll catch you on the next one.